This is SSN. Story Studio Network. I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the most painful podcast. Welcome to the Most Painful Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Hoppy. On our last show, we spoke to Virginia McIntyre on the establishment and importance of a peer support program that can help people who suffer with pain by connecting them with other people who are experiencing the same thing. So if you missed this episode, you can listen to it on our Spotify or Apple feed. And if you want to get notifications for the most recent episodes, subscribe to the podcast. Over the last four seasons, we've had many experts talk on topics of pain, wellness, fitness, and other such topics. Much of what they talk about comes from research, and research is important to help understand diseases and treatments. So if you're looking online for information to help manage your pain, how do you know if the information is correct, and how does the information get to you, the end user? Knowledge mobilization is a method to disseminate research information. To talk to me about this today, I'm joined by Deb Demnan, Director of Knowledge Mobilization for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence. Deb, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. Good to have you on. I know we talked offline a bit about this. So, um, you know, a lot of people, myself included, I look online for information and there's so much of it out there and research is important. Um, So maybe we can start, uh, you know, like, how does research start? How do we know that uh, what I'm reading is is, um, correct, I guess, or peer reviewed? And then uh, I guess we can tie into knowledge mobilization. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So researchers have a specific topic of interest and they develop a question and then they want to answer and then they do a lot of work to find an answer. And the research and the processes they go through, that is one thing around their areas of expertise. And then the work of knowledge mobilization and is to take pages and pages of a lot of really detailed information specific science and data and then to try to shape that into key messages and formats that are understandable by different by the general public and different groups of people that are interested in in knowing about those things yeah and i mean i i could see where that could be handy because i'm sure many people who are listening have probably gone online, you know, either the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland or, or other areas to look at research. And there's a lot to read. And, and and it could sometimes be difficult to understand, especially if it's not a field of expertise. So what you're saying, knowledge mobilization kind of takes the key messages out. And then uh, is, is that how it, it works? Yeah, exactly. So, so really, when you think about it, if you think about, okay, well, there's, um, you know, so researchers and at universities, so you think about laboratory, when I think of research, I think of laboratories, um, lots of equipment, lots of data, lots of papers and instruments and a lot of complicated things. And then if you said, well, oh, here's, oh, you want to know something about, uh, you know, what's the, what's the best treatment for whatever, take it for, for chronic pain or for, oh, I have a, I have a low back pain. So what is the best treatment for that? Here's a paper, a hundred page paper. Well, are you going to read? I'm not going to read that. Are you going to read that? We've had clinicians tell us, doctors, physicians, they say, I'm not going to read that. Don't give me, don't give me a hundred pages. Don't give me 25 pages. Give me the headlines. Give me what do I need to know? And what do I need to stop doing? And what do I need to start doing? If it's, you know, in a, in many settings, whether it's for clinicians or for um, also for people. And then because people don't have time, like we're inundated with information these days, there's so much information. And so just give me the headlines and, and help me through that. So really, I felt bad initially, because I was thinking, well, these researchers have done all this work, they've got this huge document, this, uh, like many, many, many pages, and I'm going to say, whittle that down to five key messages. (laughs) What are the five sentences? <laughs> and it was tricky because I did. I felt sort of badly at the beginning, but then I realized, no, but that's what the actual, when you think about, is it a veteran audience? Is it just, is it a person? Is it a, is it, you know, just any, any member of the public or is it a politician, not a politician, but a policymaker that is trying to to decide on a policy there, no one ever has time to read everything. So really how to make it um, really clear, concise, and the those key messages 
and make sure that those key messages are directed to the appropriate person, whether it's a, are you directing that message to a veteran? Are you directing that message to the general public? Are you directing it to a policymaker or to a clinician, be that a physiotherapist or a, an occupational therapist or a psychiatrist, whoever that is, we need to tailor those messages to the right people. I find it interesting. You say that even uh, clinicians are saying, "Hey, don't give me a hundred pages to read." And, and but you know, knowing clinicians, the, the hours they put in, I, I could see where that could be a challenge. So, having the the I guess Cole's notes in a sense um, is helpful because really that's what they're basing their treatments on, is it not? Absolutely. So they have clinical practice guidelines, and then but really when you think about the research and the evidence that's coming out. Um, interestingly, it takes, uh, it is cited that it takes 17, on average, 17 years for research evidence to make its way into practice. So I was shocked by this. But if you think about how, you know, it's behavior change, and how does that information make its way? So, so the evidence, it takes a long time for all of the uh, changes to take place. That would mean, you know, if you know that there's, um, you know, a therapy or a medication or something that could be beneficial for a certain condition, then there's, there's a lot of things that need to happen and a lot of people that need to buy into that. They need to understand it. Then they need to do what needs to be done in order to make it, to make it, um, you know, uh, available in a clinical setting. So um, there's a lot of a lot of hoops <laughs> to jump through along the way, for sure. But 17 years, I mean, that's a long, that's, that's, you know, that's almost a half a lifetime for some people, and especially if someone's struggling with pain. So does knowledge mobilization or KM, I guess is a short form for it, does that help reduce that time to getting that information out? That is exactly what we are trying to do. So we have a philosophy at the CPCOE is that let's shorten that time frame. And what are we doing to shorten that time frame? Uh, and we don't know how it'll be tricky, how, how much we can shorten it. But by, by working with the key knowledge users, so to inform, to inform and both our processes and as well as them. So for example, if we had um, uh, yoga therapy, for example, or yoga for to help manage chronic pain, if we have evidence that says, well, there are there's benefits to yoga and those benefits are specific to veterans. So, or not just veterans, but to the general public with chronic pain, how do we then say, well, how are we going to reach that audience? Well, first of all, let's take the evidence and say, work with some of those knowledge users, whether it's the general public or whether it's veterans, and say, does this, is this understandable to you? So here's the key messages we're trying to get out to other people similar to yourself. And then what methods or, you know, what sort of graphics, is it graphics, is it on on, um, you know, not a document, not an email, but then how can we reach you? So is it, what are the different platforms? So do we reach people through social media? Do we reach them, you know, on Instagram or Facebook, or do we send emails directly, or do we have people try to get people in person? And then, so we work through that uh, collaboratively with those groups. And then that really helps in terms of getting the information out there. So what you're doing is sense like a focus group where you're you're taking this initial report the researcher has uh, summarized it to five main points you now are reaching out to some of the end users to see if that resonates with them or if that's helpful and then you go to a wider audience is that kind of the steps Yes exactly so we we work on creating taking those messages putting them into a format that would be understandable and digestible by that audience uh, so, because of course, if you look at it, a government audience would be different than a clinical audience would be different than a veteran or the general public. And so, yes, we take those messages and then we, we sort of package them up in a way, whether it's with uh, a small video or an infographic or whether it's, um, 
a document, it could be a policy brief if it was going to to uh, government, and then we package those, and then we determine, okay, now what are the best ways to get that information out there? And the reliability of research, I guess, is the other question, because these, I mean, you know the researchers you're working with in this in this case, because they are funded through the CPCOE to do research. And so if the audience isn't aware, the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence is a research um, organization that does research on chronic pain. So you're funding the research. So you know it's what you're getting is been ethically conducted. But are you receiving any other research that is not done by the CPCOE that you are now doing knowledge mobilization with? So... What we do is the, yes, we support the researchers in terms of the research that we're funding and helping them uh, share those messages and get those messages out to the proper audiences. And then the other things we do are in the chronic pain landscape, we do look for evidence from you know, different, different, even different countries. So we go across and we scan. And is there other evidence that we call it ready for prime time? Is there evidence that we maybe didn't fund, but it's available, and we could help share that knowledge. So for example, the um, effectiveness of interdisciplinary care for for the management of chronic pain. So we know that that is the best available, that is the best available evidence, that is the best care is the interdisciplinary model, the biopsychosocial spiritual model. And so we share that information. uh, And, you know, so we do other activities around that. Um, But I know what you're saying about the the rabbit hole you can go down with searching on the internet of what is actually evidence based. And so we, we really try to focus only on the evidence like what we can say is this is uh, research that is you know it's been peer-reviewed it's published and it's in you know in various spaces and we do not go to um, just random internet (laughs) sites and (laughs) start to share that information because that is a big rabbit hole that could cause a lot of problems for sure yeah and i mean we uh, like you said, there's so much information out there, be it social media, be it online, be it, it's, it's everywhere. So for the audience listening, I guess, um, you know, going after peer review is the best, but I, I understand even that sometimes has its its concerns, but you try to do the best you can. But KM seems to be, if it's coming from a good source like, like yours, is one way of getting that information in chunks, uh, manageable bite sizes versus reading the whole piece of paper. So when you're doing a KM process, how does that start? I know you start with the research, but are the you said the researchers are providing the uh, the synopsis, or are you also going through the papers yourself and taking the, the points that you feel are important? Like who decides what's important out of that paper to, to, uh, put into that bite size? Because I mean, really, from what you're saying, it sounds to me that if I'm a clinician and I'm reading that really quickly, that's what now I'm going to use in practice. So who decides that final bit of information coming out of that 100 pages of a report? Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. So initially, we are still just a young organization. And initially, Uh, we had not asked the researchers to pull that out. And so we were, our internal KM and comms team, we were trying to read those reports and pull that information out and then validating that with with our research team. Currently, we're now having the researchers that are actually doing the research because they spend, they spend, you know, two years or three years studying this. And then it's, Uh, It is not my area of expertise to then read those documents and pull out, oh, I think this is the most important piece out of this, uh, or our team. So we ask our researchers to highlight those pieces. What are the what are the key messages that you want to take away? And we actually consult with our with our researchers. So we have meetings with them and really to talk about those four questions. So what are the what are the key messages that are coming out of this and then who are the 
who who cares about this? Who's the audience that you're trying to, you know, um, because just because I did the research doesn't mean that anyone cares. So they so we sort of push them to think about, you know, is this who's this relevant to? Like, so there was a research question. You did the research. Now you have some evidence. But who cares about this? Um, and is that is it a clinician that should care? Is it is it, um, you know, a policymaker that should care? Is it other researchers that should care? Or is it the general public or or veterans? And those are really who we've identified to be our key audiences. There's other audiences, but those are our real key knowledge users, we call them. And then once they identify that, like we don't like the answer of, oh, well, everybody, everybody cares because usually everybody doesn't care. There's specific people or specific groups that care. And then we say, okay, well then what, you know, what do you want to share with them? And then how, how do we share that? And, and so it's interesting because I was thinking about this prior to talking to you is like, how do the, the, the big signs and the posters end up on buses or bus shelters or bull, like billboards, you know, that's all knowledge mobilization. How are they trying to get information? And so those ones would be the general public needs to know this. So this is a method that we've decided. Here's the message and here's how we're getting it to you. Yeah. And that, that makes sense because, um, I mean, people usually, I would suggest are looking at information that impacts them. And so, exactly. Yeah. What, what, what good is it to me and why am I looking for that and how is it going to help me? So when we're talking about knowledge mobilization, is, is that being widely used now by other institutions or schools with their research papers or is that, or is this more of a new thing? Oh, very great question, Tom. Uh, it's what we've learned is, uh, and I've only been in this role for about three years now and it is, it is a new-ish, I'll say new-ish, and what we find is that in organizations, so a lot of universities, um, and then some of the, the, research, the research institutions, but there's often just one or two people doing knowledge mobilization. So it's, uh, it's growing, it's a field that's um, that's emerging and there's the knowledge is there now that to shorten this cycle. So when I mentioned about the 17 years of, of uh, research to evidence, then now it's really trying to grow that field. And there's an organization called Research Impact Canada that uh, is a network of um of organizations and universities across Canada really trying to grow the capacity in the area because it's been recognized that in order to uh, to sort of get evidence and have an impact and then influence influence change and implement some of these new innovations that are coming out it's really it's really very very important so to not let research sit on on shelves no especially when people are looking for that information I mean, in healthcare nowadays, I would suggest people got to advocate for themselves more probably than before, mm-hmm. um, just because people are busy and their lack of doctors and all the other things that are going on. Um, so people are looking for that information. So what's a takeaway for the audience on knowledge mobilization? Like, where can they find it? How do they know? Like, we know the CPCOE, the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence for Veterans, does it. Um, so we could go on their website and look. But what about other organizations? Is it clearly marked that they've taken papers and summarized it? Or is it still kind of having to look for it? Yeah, that's a, it's a very, that is a very tricky question. And I don't, unfortunately, don't have a, don't have a great answer for you. But I would say to go to trusted, trusted um, sources, for sure. So from from our perspective on on chronic pain and our website and going to, you know, we have you can link to Instagram, you can listen to the podcast, but really it they need to be trusted sources where where you're where you're going and it all depends like you say, like on the topics that people are interested in and searching for that and then really going and if there's if there's citations around, you know, that there was research done on this and not just uh, believing everything that, that you can, you can find. 
Yeah, because we know people's attention span is short. Um, and, and so, yeah, evidence based is important. And, and that's one of the reasons this podcast basically is to take a lot of that information that's been looked at and, and uh, put it in bite size uh, tidbits so that people can walk away with something. So, no, that's very helpful, Deb. Thanks for that. And uh, for the audience listening, is is I think the key message out of this is go to trusted sources. And uh, like the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence, go on their website uh, and they've taken it to, uh, you know, 100 pages and put it into five points. So I like that. Thanks for being on the show, Deb. Thanks, Tom. On our next show, we'll be speaking to Dr. Max Sun about arthritis. Many of you have asked us to provide more information on arthritis. So he's going to talk about what it is, how to better manage arthritis. So hit the subscribe and like button. This way you'll get the latest episodes. For feedback on the show or more information on chronic pain, you can visit our website, veteranschronicpain.ca, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Chronic Pain COE and on Instagram at Chronic Pain underscore COE. Deb, once again, thanks for being on the show. And to the audience, stay safe and keep the hope alive. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network.